it's been 18 months in this war in Ukraine. How did you find the Biden foreign policy in Ukraine so far? I think Biden's foreign policy uh, could hardly be any more disastrous uh, with regards to Russia and Ukraine. Um, you know, of course, it was Biden that uh, provoked the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, when um, Russia provided um, draft peace agreements, mutual security agreements for both the U.S. and NATO that were, uh, at least on the, on the NATO side, were, was uh, completely reasonable. Um, there were a, a, a few issues with the uh, proposed agreement with uh, uh, the U.S. that I think we should have objected to. Uh, but that still would have given us, uh, you know, the ability to agree to a majority of Russia's proposed uh, peace terms. And I think if uh, if Biden had done that, or even if he had simply stated um, that um, the U.S. would guarantee that Ukraine would never join NATO, which is an open secret, uh, that, that Ukraine never will become a, a NATO member for many reasons, um, then it, it most certainly would have avoided uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and Ukraine would still uh, be in control of, uh, you know, all of its uh, uh, pre-war territory. Why they're trying to continue this war? What's behind this continuation, this policy that advocates for the continuation of this war in Ukraine? You know, that's the question on the minds of uh, of realists uh, all, all throughout the, the country here in the U.S. Um, there's no logical reason for, uh, for Biden to continue the war. Um, you know, of course, the uh, Almost all of the reasons, the rationales that he had for, um, uh, you know, continuing to fight the war uh, in April and beyond uh, have failed. Um, you know, certainly we have achieved uh, the minimal aim of preventing Russia from um, taking control of, of Ukraine, a, an objective which, uh, uh, you know, the historical record uh, suggests uh, was never uh, Putin's objective um, in the first place. Uh, President Russia, Russian President Putin um, evaded Ukraine with uh, very limited objectives. Uh, it is true that he did try to take control of uh, Kiev uh, for the purpose of uh, installing a pro-Russian or mo more pro-Russian leader, um, but um, that was not his chief objective. His chief objective was uh, was not territorial. It was not regime change. Uh, it was rather to ensure that uh, Ukraine would never be a NATO member and we become, uh, you know, permanently neutral outside of NATO. And that's something that can be achieved uh, diplomatically. Um, so uh, the Biden administration has, you know, has, has repeatedly stated that they, uh, you know, they refuse to use the word, um, I think, victory over Russia, because they understand that, um, you know, the, if Putin does view Russia as having been defeated or being defeated uh, by Ukraine, and, and of course, uh, uh, Ukraine's NATO sponsors, then uh, he could he could absolutely escalate to the nu nuclear level, most likely in Ukraine with uh, nuclear demonstration strikes that would, uh, you know, be air bursts far, uh, you know, above uh, Ukrainian cities that would uh, wouldn't kill uh, directly uh, Ukrainian citizens, but it would uh, probably use uh, you know super EMP uh, effects to uh, essentially make uh, you know Kiev um, ungovernable. Uh, forcing the uh, the government of Ukraine to uh, uh, you know to to relocate perhaps to um, Lviv. So um, you know I think I think what needs to happen at this point is uh, you know Biden needs to you know the U.S. needs to essentially declare a victory that we've um, kept the Russians out of 88 percent of Ukraine's pre-war controlled territory and and uh, you know with a, a U.S. security guarantee which would assure that if if Ukraine as a neutral country is invaded again by the Russians, that we will provide, uh, you know, massive U.S. military assistance, but no troops. Uh, I think that would, you know, with an armistice along the line of current line of control, I think that would uh, create the, uh, the opportunity for a just and lasting peace that could last um, at least half a century. Do you see any chance of Ukraine joining the EU or even NATO? This whole war is being fought by the Russians over Ukrainian NATO membership. I mean, uh, you know, I wrote an article back, I think it was back in uh, July or August uh, of last year in the National Interest, in which I stated that uh, it was very important that the U.S. US leaders um, have more strategic empathy for, for Russia. Now, what do I mean by strategic empathy? Empathy, strategic empathy is uh, essentially putting... Um, 
you know, putting us in, in Russian, Russia's shoes, what would we do under the same circumstances? Uh, a similar situation would be if uh, Texas, uh, you know, had declared independence from the U.S. in 1991 and uh, was had been allying, trying to ally with uh, with China and Russia, with Chinese and Russian troops on its soil, massive, uh, you know, you know, Chinese Russian tr uh, trainers, military trainers, training um, Texas Republican forces, um, you know, imposing a, you know, with perhaps, uh, you know, missiles, Russian and Chinese missiles based in in uh, Texas, you know, how would a, a U.S. president respond to that? Uh, the U.S., of course, would uh, uh, invade, bomb, invade, and, and annex all of Texas and call it offensive war. And that's exactly what, uh, what Putin has done. Um, from the Russian perspective, this war has been a defensive war. He hasn't tried to Putin hasn't tried to annex large swaths of uh, Ukrainian territory. 18%, I think, is pretty minimal, you know, pretty much the border regions and uh, most of the uh, of Ukraine's southern coast. But if you look on a map, you know, it's it's uh, pretty minimal considering uh, Russia's military advantages over Ukraine. Um, Putin really has, uh, you know, forced the Russian army to to fight with, with uh, one hand tied uh, behind his back, uh, much like we did in Vietnam. The, the U.S., uh, you know, didn't allow um, its troops uh, or, you know, or, or planes to, uh, uh, you know, to really take control of, of uh, North Vietnam, which could have ended the war uh, quite quickly, or at least uh, converted it to an, entirely to a, a counterinsurgency war. Um, so, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, Putin has 300,000 reserve troops on, on the Ukrainian border that he's opted not to uh, engage in a, in a, another major Russian offensive, such as we haven't seen since uh, summer of 2022, uh, suggests that Putin really is, uh, he's been trying to find a peaceful way out of, out of the war. He's, uh, you know, Russia declared over a year ago in late September of 2022, um, at following the annexations of four uh, additional Ukrainian oblasts, that it had achieved uh, nearly all of its aims of, of the so-called special military operation. And, uh, you know, was, uh, uh, offered a, a permanent ceasefire, an armistice, um, which would end the war permanently. So every every life that's been lost since then, and I would argue since uh, April of 2022, when uh, you know Russia began implementing a, a peace agreement with Ukraine, uh, with uh, the withdrawal of all the Russian troops out of three of uh, uh, eight Russian-occupied Ukrainian oblasts, is on the shoulders of Biden and Zelensky. Now, of course, I blame the Russians for you know, pulling the trigger. But what I'm saying is, is those those lives could have been spa saved and spared uh, had we uh, had Ukraine um, honored the terms of its agree peace agreement with, with the Russian Federation. The official rhetoric of the Biden administration is that Russia wa wanted to subsume Ukraine to conquer Europe. Do you see any desire on the part of Russians to conquer the Western part of Ukraine? No, no. And, um, you know, Putin easily could have defeated and, and invaded and annexed all of Ukraine or most of Ukraine um, if he would simply invaded with 500,000 troops. Uh, I mean, a lot of military analysts were saying uh, that, uh, you know, 190,000 troops was woefully insufficient. I mean, that, that's less troops than the Ukrainian army had at the time. The Ukrainian army active troop, uh, active forces uh, consisted of 200,000 men. So you don't um, you know, with, when you're a country that's, uh, you know, 35 times larger than your neighbor, or I guess maybe it was 32 at the time, um, it, you don't, inv you know, you invade with uh, with massive, massive forces as the U.S. did with, uh, in the case of the, the first Persian Gulf War in 1991, um, or at least, a, you know, at least a, a much larger force. And, um, you know, Putin clearly didn't want to do that, uh, even when he... he um, even though th that he's with he's uh, mobilized 500,000 to 700,000 reserve troops, uh, he's kept uh, about half of those um, out of the war. So, um, and and he's received a lot of criticism from Russian hardliners. Yet a lot of people don't realize that uh, Putin's neither a centrist or a Russian hardliner. In, in the Russian political spectrum, he's in between. Um, so we could, you know, we could have a lot worse if, if we had someone uh, who was a real Russian hardliner like uh, Medvedev. I think the war very possibly could have gone nuclear by now, or minimally, uh, you know, Russia would have mobilized its uh, its army much like the second, uh, what they call the the Great Patriotic War, 
um, and overrun uh, Ukraine long ago. So, um, you know, we, I think we should be counting our, counting our lucky stars that uh, that Putin is uh, is much more restrained uh, than a Russian hardline leader would be, and realize that uh, you know he is something we we someone we can work with. He's someone who is not committed. Uh, the kind of war crimes that we saw uh, committed by Hitler or Stalin or even even Tojo in Japan, and certainly not, uh, you know, uh, Mao in, in China, uh, you know, half a, 50 to 80 years ago. So, um, you know, I think it's really important that we uh, we promote peace. Uh, that's the policy that is going to save the most Ukrainian lives and ensure the security and independence of uh, 88% of uh, Ukraine's internationally recognized territory for uh, the foreseeable future. When you are cornered by NATO, they're inching toward your country. What would be the reaction of a U.S. president, not a Russian president? What would be the reaction? We cannot ignore. Just recently, Stoltenberg <laughs> said that before the invasion, Putin sent them two letters. The first time he's talking about these letters, he said that he was asking for no NATO expansion and we didn't sign it. Yeah, that's exactly what we what I just talked about with uh, you know the draft peace agreements. Um, the fact is that uh, President Russian President uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin, has been uh, pursuing a diplomatic solution to the Ukraine issue, uh, which Russia considers its number one vital interest, for 15 years before the war began. Uh, he he first issued a, a a draft mutual security agreement to to NATO, the U.S. and NATO in 2007. Uh, that was when the year that uh, pres- then President George um, W. Bush stated that uh, Ukraine and, and Georgia would would join NATO. So, um, you know, Putin actually wanted to join. He wanted Russia to join NATO. He, he stated that clearly, publicly in two thousand uh, and two, and he only gave up that that desire in two thousand seven uh, when Bush uh, clearly stated that uh, you know he didn't want Russia to be part of NATO and he would. Uh, work to expand NATO to uh, to Russia's uh, borders, uh, whether Putin liked it or not. So uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, NATO. It's NATO. It's it's um, America's, or rather, I would say, not blaming America, but rather our our uh, globalist presidents um, who have uh, pushed the expansion of of the U.S. America's uh, global liberal empire. Um, you know what? Uh, what a, a colleague of mine recently. Uh, condemned as a the greater NATO project, you know, comparing it to to greater Germany, uh, you know, Hitler of course uh, infamously tried to expand Germany's empire into uh, Ukraine and the, and uh, Western Russia, and that's very similar to what the U.S. has tried to do. Uh, you know, s- certainly less, you know, not genocidally, of course, uh, but that's uh, very similar. To what we've tried to do in trying to expand our liberal empire into uh, into Ukraine, um, which has been a you know just a horrible mistake and a total catastrophe, um, imit- unmitigated catastrophe for the West. I think. If you remember last year, General Mike Milley was advocating for the negotiating table, but nobody cared what he was talking about. And right after that, he was silenced. Who are these guys who are silencing somebody like General Mike Milley? You're absolutely right. Um, uh, when uh, you know uh, Ukraine finished its successful counteroffensive in the uh, Kherson Oblast that liberated Kherson city, uh, that was really the high water mark for uh, for Ukraine. You know, if they had ended the war right then, um, you know, they would have saved uh, you know 100,000 plus Ukrainian lives, uh, probably actually 100, 130,000, and. Uh, the borders they had 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 then would be uh, the same as as they have now. You know, as as you're probably aware, uh, you know the Ukrainian counteroffensive that's been ongoing since June 4th has liberated about 100 square miles of uh, Russian occupied or Russian annex territory, which equates to about 0.23 percent of uh, total uh, Russian annex territory at this time. So, um, you know, that's a minuscule amount, and uh, you know some reports have stated that. Uh, Ukraine has lost uh, up to 40,000 dead uh, in the last, uh, you know, four months. So that's a catastrophic figure. They've suffered around 50,000 amputations uh, since the war began 19 months ago. Um, and that's the same level, essentially, as the French in World War I, you know, so the French or the Germans. Uh, so uh, Ukrainian um, 
you know, troop losses have been catastrophic. You know, it's been a lot of, we have so many uh, Ukrainian propaganda reports stating, you know, trying to minimize Ukrainian casualties um, when in fact um, they're telling uh, U.S. leaders, uh, you know, figures that are much closer to actual figures behind the scenes. Uh, but they, uh, the U.S. government and Ukrainian government have worked together to try to uh, cover those figures up because if the American people knew that Ukraine was suffering much greater losses than than the Russians, then we would realize that Ukraine has no chance to win the war against Russia because uh, they're simply running out of troops. You know, they're uh, right now they're even they're mobilizing uh, women for war. They're drafting women uh, up to sixty years old. They're uh, uh, you know people with uh, you know diabetes and all kinds of uh, you know much much greater diseases are being mobilized that you know might belong at a hospital, uh, you know, rather than the front line. So they're getting really desperate. They're running out of troops and manpower. Uh, and of course, now with the uh, the outbreak of, of uh, the Hamas terrorist strikes in, in Israel uh, that could potentially threaten a, a wider war, uh, you know, now we're gonna, they're going to have to share, um, you know, the attention of the U.S. government and the U.S. public with Israel, which I think we have a much greater strategic interest in defending than Ukraine. It seems that some weapons sent to Ukraine are appearing in the hand of Hamas in Israel. How do you see this chain of corruption that goes from Ukraine to the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, as we all, as the liberals themselves admit, uh, Ukraine is the second most corrupt country in Europe. Um, I mean, that's only that's only uh, increased, you know, since the war began. Um, uh, there was there have been credible. Rep- Credible reports that Zelensky and other top Ukrainian government officials have um, embezzled $400 million uh, in U.S. foreign aid for their, themselves. Um, and a CBS reported in a, in a since-deleted documentary, um, it was back in se- August or September, that uh, only 30% of uh, Western military assistance was actually reaching Ukrainian frontline troops. Uh, which means, you know, up to half of that, probably around half of that has been sold in the black market um, to including to Russian buyers. And that and my source for the, the Russian buyers claim is a, a neoconservative member of Congress. So, you know, who's a you know stalwart Ukraine uh, militant, essentially Ukraine first, America last uh, member of Congress. So um, that is absolutely occurring, you know, uh, and I think that the claim by Hamas that Ukraine sold them. Not all the weapons, of course, but many of the weapons they use to kill Israelis and perhaps even Americans, because we know that uh, nine, at least nine Americans have been killed in, uh, by Hamas thus far in the last couple of days. Um, I think that's those claims are very credible. John Kirby said that he sees no corruption in Ukraine. Why he's claiming such a thing if if there is a tremendous corruption in Ukraine? Well, unfortunately, I think Admiral Kirby is, you know, I, I respected him a lot be, for his prior military service, being a, a you know, former U.S. Navy Rear Admiral. But he's really turned out to be a propagandist. You know, he's a very effective uh, public speaker, uh, an advocate for, uh, you know, for the Biden regime. Uh, but he's really quite the propagandist. And he, he's gotten worse lately, you know, in denying facts and reality and purporting these all these uh, disinformation and false narratives, uh, including that he sees no corruption in Ukraine. I mean, um, I mean, there couldn't be hardly any more corruption in Ukraine, um, uh, including the fact that, uh, you know, Biden, of course, um, was paid uh, $10 million, Biden and his son, actually closer to, I think, 15 to 17 million, if you include the 1 million a year payments uh, to his son, Hunter, from Burisma. Um, and that uh, the likely the likely possibility is that Zelensky has uh, you know, threatened to blackmail Biden if he doesn't continue massive U.S. military aid shipments, regardless of whether Congress approves them or not, um, to, you know, to uh, help Ukraine um, continue fighting the war. Because, of course, if if the U.S. cut off all military assistance to Ukraine, they'd be forced to uh, to make peace with Russia, I think, within several weeks. Uh, and much, much sooner than that, if, uh, if uh, NATO countries cut off their aid as well. I mean, it could be could one to two weeks if uh, all Western countries cut off uh, military assistance to Ukraine. So, um, yeah, the corruption is is huge. Uh, you know, Ukraine is likely blackmailing Biden to you know keep the aid flowing, and that's just a really it's a really sorry state of affairs. It's a really scary state of affairs that essentially Biden has 
subcontracted, uh, you know, na Russian national security policy to Zelensky. And Zelensky is a total hot hat. You know, he's he's trying to uh, engage in preemptive strikes against uh, Russian nuclear bombers, uh, uh, warships and submarines um, that could really uh, be used as a provocation for a, a Russian nuclear escalation. How do you see the public opinion, considering Congress as well, for the continuation of this war, sending more weapons and funds to Ukraine? Is that growing? Is that reducing? How do you find the current situation of this matter? So there's a recent CNN poll that showed that, that uh, only 45% of Americans supported any additional aid to Ukraine, including humanitarian assistance outside of like intelligence sharing and whatnot. And that only 29% of Republicans uh, support can, any continued assistance, including humanitarian aids to, to Ukraine. So I think that's really, um, really helped help the cause, I think, of uh, putting America first and also saving Ukrainians with a, an armistice uh, agreement with Russia. Um, I was really pleased to see that um, about 53% of House Republicans uh, voted against any um, you know, their Ukraine aid package. So, uh, you know, being pushed by the neoconservatives and the Democrats in the House. So I think that's, um, uh, you know, that is uh, is something that is um, hopeful. Uh, but of course, with Biden, uh, you know, President Biden uh, in control and trying to circumvent call it, uh, Congress by uh, most recently with uh, foreign military uh, financing uh, agreements, um, you know, that are going to try to keep providing Ukrainian military assistance that's not even congressionally approved, uh, you know, really uh, makes me worry um, that we could continue to risk, uh, you know, uh, some kind of either Russian, escal you know, Russian escalation to a direct war with NATO, or perhaps more likely uh, massive cyber attacks on uh, the U.S. and NATO countries. Mac Cordy is out. How did you find it? Is that a good sign for stopping this war in Ukraine? Was it a bad sign? Well, I think, you know, I, I was, I'm someone who's, uh, I would, I'm a conservative, you know, I don't hide that fact. Um, so I was, um, you know, traditionally I've sided with the House Freedom Caucus, but, you know, the majority of the House Freedom Caucus supported uh, keeping Ukraine a speaker, I mean, McCarthy a speaker, because um, he was trying to ally with them. He was trying to, if the first Republican speaker in history, of course, the Freedom Caucus has only existed for eight years. But, um, you know, he was the only one out of three Republican speakers that tried to ally rather than fight the House Freedom Caucus. So I think it's unfortunate that he was ousted. Um, I think, you know, to a limited extent, it could have been over Ukraine funding, but he'd actually, you know, he actually agreed to uh, to try to keep out Ukraine funding um, for the most part. Um, so uh, I think he was. I, th I think that if Jim Jordan, for example, is um, elected speaker, which I'm really hoping for, uh, kind of an outside chance, but if he were to be elected speaker, then uh, I think he's really going to, you know, put his foot on the brakes for additional Ukraine funding. And uh, that'll make it much more difficult for uh, for Biden to have, you know, this kind of massive funding package that some neoconservative Republican senators are, are trying to support right now, essentially wanting to vote for an entire year of Ukraine war funding in one in one vote. So they don't have to keep coming back to the trough every every few months. Uh, and that's kind of what they did last year. You know, uh, last year there was, a, I think it was a forty seven point nine billion dollar uh, aid package that's really funded the Ukraine war effort, uh, you know, all, all the way through last month. So it's it's only now that uh, uh, that the, uh, the Pentagon's running out of um, congressional um, congressionally authorized funding to uh, to give to Ukraine. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm very hopeful that we elect a speaker who's uh, even, you know, more anti-Ukraine. And I don't want to say anti-Ukraine because I consider myself 100% pro-Ukraine. Uh, but I also think we need to work with Russia. We need to peacefully coexist with Russia. I would even argue that we need to make Russia a strategic partner. Uh, but Putin's been wanting to end the war since uh, day two of the war. He said, terms on the table for, uh, you know, Russian withdrawal from the vast, uh, uh, you know, essentially letting, um, you know, 93.6% of Ukraine, um, Ukraine have its pre-war territory and, and um, now it's 80, 88%, but that's, that's still a, a doable deal, I think, that's uh, worth considering. How do you see the state of supporting Ukraine in Europe? 
Well, I think, uh, you know, the elections in Slovakia, I think, were, were very favorable to, you know, conservatives and nationalists and, and folks that want to peacefully coexist with, with Russia and, and put the brakes on Ukraine aid. So that was a hopeful development. Uh, I'm happy to see that that Poland's, uh, you know, said it's it's going to uh, suspend aid to further aid to Ukraine over this agricultural fight. I think Zelensky is, you know, he kind of behaves like a spoiled brat. You know, uh, he uh, he's always there's there's no amount of, of aid we can give to Ukraine that's enough for him. You know, I mean, whether it's 113 billion as as official figures say, or whether it's 196 billion that that we've authorized for Ukraine as the Ukrainian government states. It's a massive amount of assistance, and Zelensky is just so ungrateful. He, uh, in fact, you know, he's been not getting along with Biden for some for some time. I mean, uh, there have been reports since at least June of, of last year that uh, Biden and, and Zelensky have have a poor relationship. You know, because Zelensky is, uh, you know, so demanding and and demeaning if uh, if we don't uh, give them every everything he wants, whether it's you know F sixteens or M1 Abrams tanks that, you know, um, uh, Biden has, has finally started shipping to Ukraine. Um, it, it's just never enough, you know, and so uh, he's he's very difficult to work with. And um, I think that, um, you know, Poland, even the president of Poland even threatened to uh, prevent any uh, NATO military assistance from crossing Polish territory in Ukraine. And he was forced to walk that back. Uh, but that just shows shows you the extent that uh, Zelensky is alienated, alienating his top allies, you know, in in the West. So, um, you know, I think that uh, I think that this this uh, you know kind of the bad the bad taste that Zelensky gives his allies. I think that's going to continue and magnify as as uh, we run out of of arms and and munitions to send to Ukraine, and and his situation becomes increasingly precarious. Why he's not willing to have any election in Ukraine, in your opinion? What's at, at well, stake I think, for him? Yeah, I think he's enjoyed being a, you know, Ukraine's de facto dictator. You know, of course, there's been no, it's a, a complete lie that we're defending democracy in Ukraine because, of course, uh, democracy ceased to exist in Ukraine when um, Zelensky declared martial law and, and uh, banned 11 opposition parties, essentially all of Almost all of uh, Ukraine's opposition parties, uh, including the largest opposition party in uh, in the Ukrainian Rada, um, as well as uh, taking over, you know, trying to kill and imprison his political opponents, which he's been doing uh, with not a lot of Western media coverage. Um, I, of course, am on Ukraine's blacklist, but I'm not on their uh, their kill list, thankfully. You know, and one of the stories that I recently covered, or actually was, I'm going to write an article about is that uh, Zelensky's own wife was on Ukraine's blacklist. Uh, so there, there's a, I can't remember the, the name, the pronunciation Ukrainian, but uh, there's, it's essentially uh, the translation is the peacemaker uh, kill list. And, um, you know, back in 2019, when Zelensky was very sincere in trying to uh, implement the means to agreement with, uh, with Russia, with uh, Ukrainian military withdrawals to match Russian military withdrawals, um, you know, the, the far right neo-Nazis in, in Ukraine, um, you know, es essentially threatened the, the life of his wife, uh, you know, said, you know, we're not going to pull our forces out. And if you try to make us by sending Ukrainian army to, uh, you know, force our militias out of out of uh, the Donbass contested regions, then, you know, your the life of your wife is is at risk. So. Uh, I think he felt forced to, you know, give in and to their blackmail. And it's really unfortunate for Ukraine. Ukraine's paid a heavy price. And, uh, you know, I, I, I blame the, the right wing militias more, more than I blame Zelensky. But I also blame their U.S. US backers. You know, the CIA, of course, USAID um, uh, is, uh, you know, is kind of a CIA front group, I think. Um, and um, you know we have the CIA, of course, funded heavily funded and and uh, authorized and supported the the coup against uh, the Ukrainian democratically elected president, President Yanukovych. Um, and that's really what what triggered the Russian invasion. Uh, you know, Ukraine would have control of one hundred percent of its uh, internationally recognized territory if we hadn't um, supported that coup. So. You know, I, I blame Biden and, and uh, you know, Biden was actually the, the one in charge of Ukraine at the time under the Obama administration that authorized the coup. So essentially, wherever uh, Biden's gone, uh, whatever suffering that Ukraine is suffering under right now with uh, this unnecessary manufactured war, 
um, is, uh, you know, is really Biden. Uh, it's it's Biden that should get the majority of the blame. Obviously, I I blame Putin as well for, you know, carrying out the invasion. But as we discuss, uh, Putin has behaved much more cautiously and more restrained than, a, than almost any U.S. president would. You know, if a, if it was a U.S. president in control in Russia, I think, uh, you know, he definitely, you know, the, a U.S. president definitely would have um, tried to take over and annex all of Ukraine uh, just as a, ma a security measure, just in, in terms of securing um, the country against, uh, you know, NATO aggression. Potentially, it seems that Biden is trying to continue this war in order to have upper hand in 2024. I don't know if that's going to be any upper hand for him. Yeah, like you said, I don't think the war in Ukraine is a winning issue for the Biden administration. I mean, he, he views it as one of his greatest foreign policy triumphs. And, and perhaps if he were to, you know, to uh, mediate an armistice, it would be. I think, uh, you know, we could still achieve a, a favorable a, a success mission accomplished situation if we were if Biden were to negotiate a, an armistice with Russia uh along the current line of control you know with with NATO permanently or rather Ukraine permanently neutral outside of NATO that would I think that'd be a major triumph both for the the US and to a lesser degree uh for Ukraine and it would be acceptable to Russia as well um but uh, short of that, I mean, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, the U uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. voters are really souring on the Ukraine war. Um, it's taken longer than I would have liked it to. Um, but um, it's not a winning issue for for the Biden administration that I that I can guarantee. Um, so, I mean, his stay in the polls is, is uh, I think he's about 41 percent on average. I mean, every other president with his polling standing at this point in the election cycle, I think, has gone down to defeat with uh you know, very few, if any, exceptions. Uh, but the problem is uh, the Democrats have uh, figured out how to steal the elections. You know, uh, we've gone from one of the least corrupt countries in the Western Hemisphere to one of the most corrupt countries in the Western Hemisphere, thanks to the, to the, uh, the Democrats, um, you know, and, and rigging the elections. And um, uh, the problem is, you know, with President Trump, you know, they, uh, they're pursuing the uh, kind of the putin Zelensky handbook in persecuting and trying to imprison for life uh, Biden's main presidential challenger, Donald Trump. Uh, regardless of what you think of Donald Trump, he doesn't, he hasn't committed any crimes, you know, any crimes worthy of, of being imprisoned. Uh, certainly none as president or since, uh, you know, there may have been some corrupt dealings uh, when he was a businessman prior to him being elected president. But, you know, in terms of actual scandals, uh, he was pretty much scandal free during his presidency, other than, you know, the payments to, uh, to uh, pro you know, prostitutes that occurred prior to his uh, ele his election as president. So, um, you know, with that, uh, there was a poll taken that only thirty five percent of Republicans would actually vote for President Trump if he's the nominee and he's a convicted felon. So, uh, that would be a blowout election victory for Biden. You know, short of that, I think Trump or any other Republican uh, who's a, a Ukraine war skeptic, such as DeSantis or uh, Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, would have a blowout victory over Biden if the election was free and fair. So uh, the problem is I don't believe it's ever going to be free and fair again. And so uh, I, th I do think Biden has the edge to get reelected, which is a really sad state of affairs, given the fact he'll he'll be uh, essentially 82 the month of the election. And he's uh, super senile, the most traitorous corrupt president we've ever had, and really a war monitor. You know, it'd be one thing if he was if he was horribly corrupt and in the in the hands of, uh, you know, his Chinese communists, paymasters but you know if he actually supported peace you know maybe we could look past some of those short those major shortcomings but the fact that he's trying to fight world war three with russia and china almost at the same time with his his uh, declarations that uh, the u.s will defend uh, taiwan militarily really puts the u.s and i would argue uh, not only the u.s but uh, the entire western world in a, in a really sca scary state of affairs uh, because World War III could cost a billion lives. You know, it wouldn't destroy humanity by any means, but, um, you know, it could kill up to a billion people. It might be 200 million or it could be a billion people. So, um, you know, it would make World War II look like Disneyland in comparison. We don't we don't want to face that, especially when there's no reason to. Hillary Clinton just recently said that Putin hates democracy. He interfered in 2016 election and he's going to interfere in 2024. 
Yeah, Trump won a legitimate victory. It was a it was a uh, one of the fairest. Uh, I mean, actually, there was Democrat fraud. There was actually a three million votes by some calculations of Democrat votes, but Trump still won. You know, so it was um, his election victory margin was likely much larger than uh, than was actually reported. Um, <clears throat> now it is true. Well, it is true that uh, Russia did try to interfere in the elections. They were pushing Trump. They were they were trying to to push the narrowest possible outcome. So, um, you know, they were essentially trying to create uh, chaos and confusion and conflict internally in the U.S. Uh, because we've been acting so much against them, and you know, with, uh, you know, pushing Ukraine NATO membership. Uh, but ultimately, they didn't have any impact on the outcome of the election. Uh, on the other hand, Chinese, uh, the communist, communist China, um, you know, according to the reports that I've read, they did interfere in the 2020 election uh, with uh, their control of Dominion voting uh, machines, which they purchased with a you know a Chinese holding firm purchased Dominion voting um, in uh, one month before the November 2020 election, and then I think they colluded with the the Democrats to steal the election from Trump. Uh, I think if the uh, election had been free and fair, Trump would have won an ele another electoral uh, landslide, and uh, you know, and he would have he would have promoted peace. He would not have you know. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, a lot of Trump supporters claim that Putin would have never invaded Ukraine because he was afraid of Trump or some stupid, stupid thing like that. In fact, Putin would have never invaded Ukraine because he didn't view Trump as a threat. You know, Putin only only acts, uh, you know, with an international aggressor. He only commits an international aggression when he, when he feels that Russia's security is threatened. So. Uh, in the case of Donald Trump, you know, we know that uh, Donald Trump actually tried to leave NATO or he, he told his uh, closest advisors he wanted to leave NATO on at least two occasions, I think in 2018 and 19. And uh, I'm sure that Putin was aware of that. You know, Putin was aware that uh, Trump was not a huge uh, NATO supporter. He was not really, he was not anti-Russian by any means. In fact, he ran on a, a platform of, uh, you know, a comprehensive peace agreement with Russia which if it weren't for the Trump-Russia collusion hoax, I think he would have he would have been able to successfully implement. And our U.S. security and, and the peace of the world would be great, would have been greatly enhanced by such an agreement. Do you agree with the Trump's policy on NATO? I do think. I, I've long stated, and I wrote in 2019 in a, a World Net Daily article, that uh, NATO membership for the U.S. was a noose around uh, America's neck that could drag us down into an unnecessary uh, nuclear war with uh, with Russia, and I'm, I mean, I, I think that my prediction is getting close to being uh, proven correct. I don't want to, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I hope we can have an armistice with uh, with Russia and Ukraine, or just minimally, you know, we don't even need to worry about the war in Ukraine. We the war in Ukraine will resolve itself in a fair, re, uh, relatively fair manner if the U.S. would simply stop inter interfering militarily. If we were to simply you know, state that we support peace, we'll support any diplomatic efforts that Russia and Ukraine choose to negotiate. Uh, we won't take a position on the details, uh, but we're not going to provide uh, aid to either side in the war. Uh, that's the policy we should have pursued in World War I. It's the policy we should have pursued in World War II uh, to, you know, to end those wars prematurely, or perhaps even, you know, in the case of the war in Ukraine, it could have prevented the war from occurring in the first place. You know, it could have been over within weeks. And, um, you know, tens of millions of lives in the case of the, 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 the two, these two unnecessary world wars could have been could have been saved in the lives of six million Jews. I mean, a lot of people realize that, that, uh, you know, our, our decision to fight the war uh, against Nazi Germany didn't save any Jews, really. Uh, they were all exterminated. But, uh, you know, um, it's this is a subject for for a different different uh, uh, episode, I guess, or interview. Among these Republican candidates, we have Donald Trump, the highest chance of winning in twenty twenty four. After that, Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis. It seems that Ron DeSantis was flip flopping his idea on Ukraine. Why he's changing his mind on Ukraine, in your opinion? Ron DeSantis has always been against the war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, during the two thousand twenty two. Um, gubernatorial campaign he filled out a, a kind of an issues questionnaire in which he stated u.s should not give any aid to ukraine um u.s you know ukraine is not a, a vital interest that the u.s should defend militarily let alone by arm shipments so um you know i think a lot of people a lot of 
his Republican critics claim that he's played both sides. In fact, he hasn't. I mean, if you read his actual words, I mean, the only thing he changed was he said that uh, Putin was a war criminal, you know, which I, I actually would disagree with. I think he was, um, you know, obviously he's an international aggressor and we need we need to condemn that. But um, I, I don't think DeSantis has played both sides. Now, he's he's uh, Vivek has been the most uh, the strongest in terms of his opposition to uh, aid to Ukraine. But uh, I mean, DeSantis just had a recent interview in which he he stated pretty strongly that he he opposed aid to Ukraine. Problem is, DeSantis is trying to get uh, you know donor money, and a lot of his uh, you know Republican mega donors are you know Ukraine aid supporters. So he has. It is true that he's uh, his rhetoric has been um, you know a little bit more um, uh, kind of middle of the rowish roadish on that issue but in fact uh i know for a fact that his instincts are sound and that he if he were elected president he would end uh aid to ukraine so um i think that's that's really the good news is um you know trump DeSantis, and vivek ramaswamy they're three of the four leading candidates the other of course being haley um in the republican presidential nominee uh you know primary race are all very strong in uh supporting peace with russia and ukraine and ending this uh, uh this senseless war are they going to be able to kick Trump out of 2024? No, they won't be able to kick him out. Like there have been some ballot challenges and they've been uh, they've been refused that the cases have been refused for hearing by the Supreme Court. Uh, so Trump's, you know, Trump's he's like leading by 40 plus points. I mean, short of a miracle, he's going to be our nominee. Uh, hopefully he'll pick someone strong like uh, Vivek Ramaswamy or um, maybe Christy Noam or someone like that as his uh, vice presidential nominee. But um, he, uh, yeah, he's he's going to be on the ballot. Um, he likely will be the nominee. Um, and if he doesn't get, you know, again, if he doesn't get convicted of a felony and if the vote were free and fair, he would win. I mean, according to the polls show him winning uh, by a narrow margin right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the margin would be much greater if the, the vote were free and fair. The problem is we're, we're never going to have a, another free and fair election in this country, unfortunately, America is not, uh, you know, a totally free country. We're not a totally, you know, we're not a free constitutional republic like we used to be before Biden took over uh, and started implementing um, his autocratic measures. You know, he claims to be fighting for democracy. In fact, uh, he won't even fight for democracy here at home. He's uh, an autocratic leader, you know, not a dictator, of course, as yet. He could be, he could choose to be, uh, but he is an autocrat uh, like Putin and Zelensky. Uh, without uh, without the murders to his name, and and that's some of a, a huge difference that I'm happy to point out. I hope we never get to that point. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, I think Biden has the edge. Unfortunately, I think you know even though he's he's senile, he's super corrupt, he's treasonous, uh, he he has difficulty uh, you know putting complete sentences together, uh, and yet uh, the Democrats don't care because they are very confident they can steal the election even if they need to steal 10 million votes instead of three to six as it as they have in the last two presidential elections what's your take on rfk jr he was trying to join the democratic party they didn't let him in and he's going to run independent i don't see any chance of him winning 2024 but he's gonna take some votes from republican and democrats because he's in the middle which party going to be affected by his campaign, in your opinion? Well, RFK Jr. is a lifelong Democrat. He's uh, obviously he's the the nephew of a of a sitting president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Um, you know, on many levels, in terms of national security and foreign policy, his his policies match up pretty pretty well with JFK's. JFK, of course, uh, you know, famously said that he would pay any any that America should pay any price to defend liberty abroad. And I think that's that's a horrible thing. But he didn't actually, you know, pursue that. He didn't try to liberate Eastern Europe from from the Soviets. He didn't wasn't crazy, some crazy lunatic that that wanted to fight a nuclear war when he had the chance to. Um, he had the chance to fight a nuclear war, which the US would have won uh that time because we had five to nine times more strategic nuclear weapons over the Soviets at the time. But he instead chose peace, and he chose to negotiate a nuclear arms control treaty, the first ever in 1963 with the Soviet Union. He chose to give up more than he got with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, you know, giving up uh, you know nuclear missiles, U.S. nuclear missiles in in uh, Italy and Turkey, and 
uh, in exchange for and and promising to never invade uh, Cuba, which was essentially a renunciation of the West of the Monroe Doctrine, in exchange for uh, Russian withdrawal of, of their nuclear missiles from Cuba. So, our, I think RFK Jr. is very attractive um, on some issues, but on others he's quite liberal. You know, of course he's very liberal on I think climate change. He's liberal on uh, social issues. He supports abortion on demand. He tried to oppose it, but then he was forced to backtrack because all of his supporters are liberal Democrats. So I really think that, you know, he's going to get it probably about 3% of the vote. And I think he takes away from Biden. I don't think he takes away from Trump. Um, I, I don't know of a single Trump supporter who, who really, you know, views RFK as, as more than, uh, than a kind of um, a useful ally to defeat Biden. I mean, there's... Um, I, I can't think of a single one of my friends that would consider voting for him. Um, I don't think RFK, I think RFK is a, cla a classical liberal, a classical liberal, the kind that I grew up with when, in, back in the 80s when I was in high school. Uh, he's someone we can respect. He supports civil rights. He supports freedom, freedom of speech, all the good things that liberals stood for back then. Uh, and he's really a dying breed. You know, uh, there's really no classical liberals left in, in the Democrat Party in terms of, uh, you know, national elected leaders. They're all extremists. They're far left, you know, far left, uh, woke Marxists. Um, the stuff that they support now, if, if they had run in the 80s, they would have all been defeated and rightly so. So uh, RFK Jr. is a breath of fresh air on a lot of issues. And I wish him the best. And I hope he gets as much support as possible. And I think uh, if he does, that will help uh, the Republican presidential nominee, uh, you know, cruise to victory, um, you know, against against, uh, you know, all of the uh, the fraudulent, you know, Democrat rig rigged election. Uh, that may be our only chance, really, to be honest, of, of, of winning, of defeating uh, Joe Biden. Who's going to be the next president of the U.S.? Biden reelected Donald Trump, Vivek Ramaswamy, Ron DeSantis. I think chances are very strong that Biden is reelected. Um, that said, I think there's a, also a high chance that Biden could could drop out of the election and try to get Harris elected president. Um, there's Who's going to replace him? Right. Who's going to replace him? Gavin Newsom? Well, so I think Biden, uh, if the rumors are true that Biden is is trying to like wait out until after the Democrat primary process is over, and then he would he would. Uh, drop out of the race, uh, essentially when it's already over, perhaps he's even the already the nominee or just prior to that, uh, and, and endorse uh, Kamala Harris as the Democrat presidential nominee. And, and um, so, uh, you know, all the polls show that uh, Republican presidential candidates poll better against Harris than they do against Biden, which to me is is kind of strange because, you know, Harris is, is not smart. You know, she's, she's extreme, but she's not a traitor. She's not you know, she's corrupt, but, you know, on the normal level of corruption, not extreme corruption that we see from from Joe Biden. So, uh, you know, for all those reasons, I would think that Kamala should be more popular. But, you know, I mean, Kamala, Kamala Harris and, and Joe Biden are just really the worst presidential ticket we've ever seen. The idea that they could they won more votes than than Donald Trump um, in 2020 is, is really just laughable. Um, Certainly now that we know the level of, of their corruption and, you know, with Biden being so much more mentally absent um, now than he was uh, two and a half years ago or three years ago almost now. So unfortunately, I, I do predict that Biden will, will be uh, elected or um, if he doesn't run, if he drops out, I think uh, Kamala Harris or perhaps Gavin Newsom would be, you know, Gavin Newsom, of course, is kind of the uh, the. Um, Black horse candidate that would you know ready to step in if, if Biden drops out and doesn't endorse Harris. So, and I, I've I've listened to I've watched his interviews and I think he's very formidable. I don't agree with them, but uh, you know Biden used to have the ability to speak in a kind of um, a more moderate way. You know he was always uh, on the far left, not the extreme far left as as he is now, but he was always uh, you know one of the most liberal members of the U.S. Senate when he was in the Senate. But he was able to talk moderately. He talked about his friends um, who were Republicans. He talked about bipartisan policies, and he was actually sincere about it back then. Um, I don't think uh, Gavin Newsom is quite to that level, but he's somewhere in between. His rhetoric is less extreme. He's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say more inclusive, but he's more friendly. He's willing to speak to Republicans and not treat them like, you know, 
like they're some kind of extremists or or something like that, like Biden does. So I think if if Gavin Newsom were were you know I, the nominee, I think uh, the Democrats could win fair and square. I think they wouldn't need to steal any votes. So he's really the candidate I think I fear the most on that level. But I hope that uh, he might be a little less extreme than Biden as president. 